<laughs> no, I mean, to a certain extent, I only partially understand this as well. I don't know where he came up with the ideas doing this. It's really uh, came out of left field, this. It was very strange, and people had enormous difficulty accepting his ideas when they first came out. But in the end, it was such a useful tool that everybody adopted it. Feynman diagrams are a wonderful way of describing an interaction. And uh, it was introduced, the, the notation was introduced by Richard Feynman. And they have a very particular form. They're trying to describe events where you have two particles, imagine these two things which I've stolen from George, moving together and bashing apart. That's the basic scattering process. So Feynman came up uh, with this idea, as, as did another physicist called Stuckelberg, who had a similar idea, but f the name has stuck with Feynman for, for this pictorial representation. And the idea, I think, is, is, is fairly easy. Um, the implications are phenomenal of what you can do with them, but the idea is fairly easy. Now, if I were to think of time moving this way, then these two particles, when they're moving together like that, if time is moving that way, I plot it as a graph where they come together with time, as time progresses that way, and they back apart. So you know what your incoming particles are. This is called your in-state. They could be electrons, they could be an electron and a positron, it could be anything coming in, because you can detect that. You can also detect the final particles out here. They may again be an electron and a positron, they may be photons. Now I'd like you to imagine this is happening for a very small particle, a tiny particle. Like a what? Well, an electron, for example. We'll talk about electrons scattering off an electron, an electron scattering off its nemesis, the anti-electron, the particle which wants to destroy it. So this is going to kill that one. But what goes on in between? OK, that's the interaction. That's when Feynman was doing his work, he was looking at the interactions between electrons, positrons, and, and light, photons. It's called QED, quantum electrodynamics. They're coming together, and in between, something strange happens. A particle of light, a photon, is emitted from here in the quantum mechanical version of this, and is absorbed by that one, and they move apart. So Feynman thought of that as a diagram where these two particles, these two electrons, move forward in time, so they're moving this way, but time is running that way, so that's these two paths. And at this stage, this particle gives out a particle of light, which he represented by a little wiggly line like that. And then this particle is scattered and moves outwards, because it recoils as these two come apart. And another electron is scattered off there. And that's his version of the idea that there's a Coulomb repulsion between these two charged particles. They come together, they don't actually collapse, they, get, they collide, they get very close together and then they move apart. He, you'd know what was coming in, you'd know what was going out, and you had to have a way of representing what was going on in between. And he came up with this pictorial way. Because it turns out it's not a simple one-to-one -one map. It's not that um, if you have two particles coming in here, there's only one way that you'll get these two particles going out. There are many ways that when these two come in, these two can go out. If it were the antiparticle, he would draw the diagram somewhat differently. He would, and what I'm doing is building little building blocks of what's going on quantum mechanically as though I'm making a Lego model. This is the particle, this is the antiparticle. And it comes together, the electron and the anti-electron, and it smashes it together and creates nothing but energy. They come in equal and opposite momentum, there's no momentum, there's a huge amount of energy which is released as a photon in the quantum mechanical process, and then this energy is taken away and this might produce something else. There's no reason why it has to be an electron. It might produce a muon, an anti-muon. And what the Feynman diagram does, it, 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 it allows you to work out all the possible combinations of the particles which will lead to a given end state. From each diagram, you, you can work out the probability of that event occurring. I was thinking of trying to think of an analogy. Uh, 
when students leave their houses to come to university. You know what the beginning is, it's they're leaving their houses, and you know what the end point is, they've arrived in the university. But they can go all different routes. And um, some routes are more probable, you know, the most direct routes the most probable. And then routes around back streets are less probable. But you could map it. You could actually map it if you want. You start here and you end here and you can draw these different routes. And then you can give a weighting or a probability for each of them. And this is what Feynman diagram does, but it does it for the particles. Well, here's another one which is quite fun. This is the particle whizzing along in time, forwards in time. And it says, oh, I don't feel very nice. I'm a bit naked. I like to dress myself. So it actually says, oh, I'll have one of those going on. I'll emit this photon and then I'll absorb it again. Or I can have another one on top of that. I can have a one that goes around from there to there. And so it has a whole series, rather like Pigpen in, in Charlie Brown. You remember the character that walked along and had a cloud of dust around him? Had this horrible cloud carrying all the way through the cartoon strip. Well, this says the electron travels along and carries along with it a virtual cloud of these particles, photons, fluctuating around it all the time. And this is called a self-energy correction, and it affects the mass of the particles, which is no longer the same as the mass you started with, but corrects it. And Feynman turned these diagrams, which seem so elementary, into a mathematical language, which created a field theory, which is incredibly accurate. Particles come in, they interact, bang, 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 and out go other particles. You know what's coming in, you know what's going out. And the Feynman diagram is a procedure that allows you to work out which is the most likely route to get to those, that outcome. And it plays a huge role in particle physics. He made the complex language of quantum field theory, uh, as invented by Schwinger, uh, into a language which, with a set of rules, anybody could do. He made the whole landscape clear. For example, the, all the work that's going on at CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider, they're looking for this infamous Higgs particle, okay, and they're looking for dark matter particles, and they're looking for evidence of supersymmetry. One of the guiding principles they use to determine how to go to look for these particles are these Feynman diagrams. So this language, which professional physicists use, theoreticians use, then finds applications not only in elementary particle physics and solid state physics as well. So you can talk about electrons in a superconductor exchanging photons between them. No, not photons, phonons. The electrons couple through phonons and that's the basis of superconductivity. So this language permeates all of theoretical physics. They can be really complex. And uh, so the, when you're a graduate student and you first do a particle physics uh, course and uh, you indeed do do these simple uh, basic Feynman diagrams. In fact, they do them at undergraduate levels now, uh, the most basic diagrams. They're called the tree level diagrams. They're the first order diagrams. They, they often will be the ones that dominate, but they don't always. Then there are, but there are other, as I said, you know, you, you don't always go the direct route. There are perhaps lots of other ways of reaching that particular finals, final um, stage and um, they can be extremely complicated. But when you're doing these calculations to work out things like masses of particles, strengths of couplings, you actually have to include all the possible combinations. And, and so you have to be able to go through these narrow back streets, the equivalent of them, to get to the final outcome. 